Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We're your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to another episode of the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their art. I'm Devani. And I'm Leora. And our guest today has super important information for entrepreneurs and creators interested in growing their business. Jason McDonald teaches business owners the art and science of getting anything to the top of search engines. Director of the JM Internet Group, this brilliant SEO and digital marketing expert is author of the popular Amazon bestseller digital marketing book, marketing workbooks, SEO fitness, social media marketing, and AdWords workbooks. In 1994, before digital marketing was even a thing, Jason started his own technology blog focused on the domain eg3.com, which reached over 50,000 subscribers in the digital systems niche. Today, through teaching digital marketing courses and corporate workshops, Jason pursues his passion of taking complex topics and making them easy to understand and practical for business owners. And we're relieved about that because most creatives eyes glaze over when they hear the term SEO and digital marketing. So welcome, Jason. Well, I'm glad to be here. So uh, you started blogging in 1994, which was a year before I was born. So how did you get started? You were basically, as the kids say, you were cool before it was cool. So right. how did that come to be? A little too early, yeah. So it's sort of, a, I worked at a media company. So I worked at a media company in San Jose. It was very, very techy. It was what's called embedded systems. So these are like engineers who make um, like anti-lock braking systems and fax modems at the time and this kind of stuff. And we produced these print catalogs. I probably should have saved some, you know, as relics, but we would produce these print like magazines and print catalogs for Intel and Motorola and whatnot. And it was right at the dawn of the internet. And uh, sort of a funny story. We would go to trade shows here in the United States and literally people would come and they would beg me for editions of these books. They would be from Germany. They would be from Japan and they could not get these books in their host country. It would, you know, eons in a modern sense, it would take six months for them to get into distribution in Japan. And so I started an email list and I started taking information and emailing it to these people, mainly outside the US. And it was right before even a blogging was possible. And so the email list just grew and grew and grew and grew. And then that got me into basically putting information on the website. And, and I'm so old, I remember putting the first image on my website, the first picture <laughs> and being right. really excited at figuring out the code to do that and other people being really excited that we were able to put pictures so that I mean it really dates myself right that was 1994 it was a long right. time ago and that just grew and grew and grew and that got me into all the other you know as this industry grew that got me into you know what, what is today SEO which is how to get something to the top of Google you know, social media comes along about 2009, et cetera. And, and of course, AdWords, which is the advertising platform. Now, okay. did you get into, so and just a little bit of a side, because also I want our audience to know, and we actually talk with a lot of in our, the folks in our community about the importance of writing to keywords, for instance, like, you know, it, 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 that if you want to get your work found, you can have the most brilliant ideas, the most brilliant product, but if no one finds you, then it doesn't, then you're not, you're not, you're not served and nor is your audience who wants to find you served. And so it's such an important thing. Um, it's like, I can see how you're getting into that might have grown, but what was your, what was your interest that led you down to this more specific SEO type things? It, it, it was exactly that. It was like, so I kind of knew because I knew people at the time. So it was a small community. And so I did know people. And then, you know, I started to realize, well, 
how would people discover this information who, who didn't know me, who hadn't met me at a trade show, who weren't part of this tight-knit community. And that got me thinking about discovery, about how discovery works. And that was before Google. Google comes around in 1999. Um, so that was before, and there was a whole plethora of, of search engines at the time, web crawler and like, a, we kind of forget that Google was really just one of many search engines that then consolidated. And so that, that discovery process is exactly that. How would people do, how would people discover this information? And so, um, you know, long story short, I'm a recovering PhD. I have a PhD from Berkeley. Uh, so I've always been interested in information and ideas and how they spread. And so I just started to like reverse engineer this, like, well, how would you find this? Where would you go? And this is important for your entrepreneurs and people in your audience. You know, you've got to look at the world from the perspective of your customer or your target reader or the person who you want to subscribe to your Instagram channel. And you've got to look at it from their perspective. How would they go about discovering you? What is the, mm -hmm. what is the process? And then it's kind of like Hansel and Gretel. You've got to put the little breadcrumbs out there so that they can discover you. That, that's your right. job, you know, but you've got to look at it from their perspective. Definitely. And, and that's, you know, in a way that takes, uh, it is an art and it's a science in particular and the SEO and the, you know, but people who are, who love science, you know, numbers can be art and can very much be equated with art. And so the algorithm, algorithms and systems that, that monitor and track those things, really it is another form, you know, even coding is another form of art. In fact, we know um, a guy, Jason, uh, sorry, Justin Gilchrist, who um, is a coder. He's actually an, um, a serial entrepreneur in the UK. And he's also started uh, early on with his website stuff as a coder. And he said, when he starts, you do coding too, right, Jason? Right. Well, HTML okay. coding, which is sort of baby okay. coding. Okay. Okay. So he said that when he gets into coding, it's like a meditation. It kind of like disappears mm -hmm. into the zone because those who are into numbers and patterns and rhythms and that sort of thing, it's also, it's like a puzzle. It's like art. Um, you know, so I can see where that would... It, and yet to creatives, it's like we would think of writing an article with a creative catchy title, mm -hmm. you know, something that would speak to our spirit or would speak to the muse in us. And yet that might, you know, when people are looking for something, they're probably not going to use those terms. So could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, I'm a big uh, believer in analogies. And, uh, you know, one of the principles, one of the things I have in my books, uh, my class at Stanford, I like to kind of beat people over the head with this idea of like either or thinking and how it's not really helpful. Uh, so let me give you an example, right? We tend to think it's common. People fall into this trap of thinking either, you know, you're an artist, either you're creative, you know, or you're practical, right? Those are opposed, right? Now, if you think about cooking as a good example, uh, my mom is a big cook. I, I love to cook. I got that from my mother. And, um, Cooking has a lot of creativity. It's very inspirational. It's a very creative thing to, you know, to cook a souffle, to, to make potato salad is actually quite creative. However, there's a lot of technical knowledge that you have to have to do a good job at it. And, and it's not, they're not opposed to each other. A good cook is also very good at technical knowledge. And that's something I really would like your audience, people listening to think about is don't fall into this trap of thinking, well, I'm a creative writer and therefore I don't want or need to know the technical aspects of how to communicate with Google. Those go with your creative writing. They're, they're part of it. And that technical skill um, is not a contradiction. And I think that's really helpful when people look at this as a process. Um, and you're right, computer code, et cetera. There's a lot, of, you know, so what is, I think it's um, uh, Thomas Edison that said success is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. It's, you, yeah. know, being, you know, being a writer myself. So, um, so there's a lot of technical to writing a blog post that could be shared, that people will want to share. And you write the headline is the most important aspect of that. There's a lot of writing a blog post so it shows and ranks on Google which is an HTML and SEO um, part, but they're not contradictory. Those go together. You need both of those things to work uh, together. Right. I'm a real big believer in that. 
So a lot of our audience, uh, we have a lot of authors in our audience as well as visual artists from painters to photographers, sculptors, what have you. When it comes to some of those, you know, it's there's some of those artists like writers, for instance, fiction writers, that seems to be one of the harder genres for ranking for keywords and even finding different kinds of keywords. Because most people, if they're looking for a, fic a good fiction book and they like fantasy, then they're going to be searching fantasy fiction. And all the big guys and all the big authors and the big publishing companies have so much of that locked up. So what advice can you give to our audience of, of fiction authors, for instance, uh, when it comes to how to get found and how to even begin to show up near page one of Google? Yeah, right. So you're absolutely right. So I'm an author myself, nonfiction. I have a very big project with a fiction author uh, that I, I work on their AdWords and some of their advertising. And there's a huge difference between fiction and nonfiction. And so uh, nonfiction, you're, you know, my books, you go to Amazon, you put in search engine optimization. My book ranks, you know, one or two on Amazon and you find me, you discover me. It's a very kind of rational process. Uh, you know, it's, yeah the way that we read fiction and I'm a huge, huge fiction reader. I love fiction. I read fiction all the time. Uh, and fiction discovery is different, right? So if you're an author of fiction, you want to start to think about, well, how do people choose books to read? What are the processes they go through and, and what's that like? And, um, you know, take Stephen King's It, right, which became this huge movie sensation the last mm -hmm. six months or nine months or whatever, right? It's not that people go to Google and type in It and find it and, oh, I want to read a scary story about a clown, right? That's, that's not what they're doing. They know Stephen King, they know the genre he writes in, and they, they already have discovered him. But if you're not Stephen King and you don't, you know, right out the gate have a bestseller because you're so well known, you know, what, what, you know, how you have to start to think about this. And that's where it's very creative. Like how do people, you know, discover, you know, new authors and whatnot. So then you think, well, let's, you know, sort of deconstruct this. And then you get into issues such as sort of uh, one issue would be what I would call adjacent themes, right? Adjacent themes. So if you take, take that, that novel it, right. Um, you know, there's this whole issue of like clowns. Are clowns scary or are clowns yeah. not scary? Are clowns friendly or not friendly? You know, clown phobia is kind of a thing. <laughs> but people are writing, it is. I mean, it is. it's weird, right? And it's, and it's weird because what's, what's kind of interesting and thought provoking about that is what we're afraid of and what is comical are often interconnected, right? So if you were uh, writing in that genre, you might think about writing blog posts about clown phobia and what is clown phobia and how does it work because people might look they might search for that and they also might talk you know imagine you you wrote a blog post that was a quiz like are you afraid of clowns do you find clowns you know scary or do you find them funny or or both that's the kind of thing that people would share so one of the tricks for fiction authors especially with respect to blogging is to identify what i call adjacent issues that people are interested in that become good blog material, good Instagram material, et cetera. So that's one way to think about fiction promotion that does have an SEO component to it because people might search for, for that or they might hear about it or something like that and search for it. But it also has a strong social component that they would uh, share. Another issue that's, that's helpful is trending topics, right? So if you're fiction, like let's say you wrote a historical novel uh, about, um, like I'm right now I'm reading East of Eden. I'm rereading East of Eden by John Steinbeck, right? And there's a lot of immigration to California and there's a lot of weird, interesting stuff in this novel. Uh, if you were writing a novel like that, you could commentate on this huge political crisis going on at the border and immigration and family separation and all this sort of very tragic and complicated you know, disaster that's happening at our border. And then it's sort of like, oh, by the way, the person who wrote this blog post is an author who has a book on, it could be immigration to the United States in 1820. So you've got to kind yeah. of think out of the box if you're fiction yeah. about how people discover authors and that's that that's the key there it's being nonfiction is simpler it's more straightforward than being fiction yes. it is yeah. exactly that's that's what we found those are great ideas and examples and so 
what the split here is on the one hand, what you described is that could actually be where an, an author creative person could look at the adventure of discovering how, you know, to be different, how to be, uh, how to think out of the box of how do I get my book sold to what can I tie in with this topic? So I can mm -hmm. see the artistry coming in there, especially if someone has that mindset, because otherwise, you know, typically with authors and artists, it's like, they just want to paint. They just want to write, you know, I just want right. to do my work, yeah. you know, and it's like, I've written my book, my work is done, but no, it isn't not in this, in this era, mm -hmm. you know, now. So on the one hand, we have the opportunity to bring our work directly to our, our audience. You know, and so the middleman is cut out. But with that comes the responsibility to do some of that work, like you said, if it is, we want our work to get in the hands of the people who would be interested in reading it. Yes, that's so a huge, so again, sort of deconstruct this, right? The yeah. promotion of your art is a separate and important task to the production of your art. So back to cooking, if you're gonna have a dinner party, you're gonna figure out what are you gonna cook you know, you're going to cook, a, you know, if it's a summer picnic right now, if obviously it's the summertime and you're going to have potato salad and you have fried chicken and you're going to have, you know, tofu for the vegetarians, whatever, you're going to have your menu and your settings. You're going to do all this production, but you're also going to think, how am I going to promote my party? Am I going to email right. people? Am I going to put it on Facebook? Am I going to send out invitations, et cetera? So you're going to have a promotion strategy to get people to your party. And you're not gonna see that promotion strategy as in contradiction with your production, but part of it. Now, obviously, it's much easier to promote to friends and family than it is to yeah. strangers, right? So yeah. hopefully, right? So this is sort of a harsh um, message for artists, but the, the promotion of their art is, a, is important and is an, you know, important. So, to go totally different segue, I'm a huge Andy Warhol fan. I love Andy Warhol. I love modern art. I've read his books. I've gone to his museum. I went, literally, I went to Pittsburgh to go to his museum in Pittsburgh. Wow. I adore Andy Warhol. And, and if you read Andy Warhol, he's really interested in the promotion of his art as much as the production of his art. And that made him controversial. A lot of artists didn't see him as an artist because he was wow. shameless in his, up to and including his strange wigs, right? He was, he was shameless in his self-promotion. Oh, he sounds really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, right. I mean, he was, it's sort of, you know, weird sort of asides here. In terms of creative types, Andy Warhol is really the, the artist who created the idea of the artist himself as the art. So Madonna mm -hmm. and Lady Gaga and people like that are descendants of Andy Warhol. He's the one who created mm -hmm. that idea. And look at Lady Gaga, right? She's a shameless promoter as much as a brilliant artist. It's not a contradiction for her if, if, right. if they go together. So that's really important. And you as an artist have to struggle with how you deal with that issue, you know, have promotion, you know, production. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such an interesting thing too, because we're in a time where uh, it's really a lot easier and more interesting to get creative with how you promote your art. Like you were mentioning before, you can tie it to an issue and sort of be an art activist and you can go that route, which is really popular today. You know, people um, really get behind causes that they truly believe in and they make that part of their brand, no matter what artistic medium they're doing. Or you can take it as um, a way to sort of blend your artwork into some cultural thing that you're really attached to, whether it's a political issue or a global issue or just some niche of culture that you really enjoy and you're connected to. And so it makes the promotion seem a little less, hey, buy my stuff all the time. Correct. And more on the side of, hey, this is relevant, this is interesting, and I'm clearly speaking to other people who enjoy this subculture. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be completely political either, right? It, it can, yeah. there are other promotional aspects, but I, I do, again, I don't like to think of this either or thinking, you know, either you work on promotion or you work on production. I really want to think of those as both and problems and everyone has to find their comfort level, their style, what they're, you know, some people like Lady Gaga are completely comfortable with shameless self-promotion. Other people, 
not so much, right? It's just, you're gonna have to find that balance. But what you can't do is produce something and then just think magically it's gonna be discovered and, and be popular. Yeah. That, you know, unless you're Stephen King, who's already famous, it doesn't work that way. Or, or you happen to know Oprah okay. and, and get on her, you know, her show or whatever she's doing these days, right? Right. Yeah. And they really did the work. Like, it yeah. takes a long time. Like, now Stephen King is like, he publishes a book and he could drop it probably fairly obscurely and still make enough money to pay for the production of the book. But I'm sure if you dove into his story, there's a lot there where he was really hustling for years to to become Stephen King, the Stephen King we know publicly. Yeah. yeah, since you're an artistic podcast, you know, as I understand this, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure I'm correct, but as I understand it, when he wrote Carrie, which is his first novel, he was living in a trailer with his wife, and she was disgusted with him, and he was going to kill himself if it did not succeed, and that was his first oh novel. He was just wow. crazy. He wrote Carrie, and it was not originally successful and then it took in that and that took off and of course you know it's it's like they always say the the first big success is the most difficult one you know uh right. so yeah and the, a weird trivia the exorcist which became a huge novel and a huge movie the reason that that novel succeeded was that there was a cancellation on the dick cavett show and the writer of the exorcist was put on the dick cavett show um just spontaneously by kind of a wow. chance event because of a cancellation. And then of course, once he was on the Dick Cavett show back in the sixties, that got the novel going and then the novel became the book and da, 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 da. So, you know, so there is serendipity and whatnot, but yeah, you've got to be, you know, to circle back to SEO, circle back to social media, circle back to the digital world. You know, we, we, it's kind of a double-edged sword. We live in an era in which there's a lot of publicity opportunities open to everyone, but you have to do the hard work to understand the technical aspects, you know, of Instagram, of Facebook, of Google, and, and how that works. And that's where I came from was the technical side. And now I'm kind of moving more into, like, I can talk a lot about book promotion and things like that, but, but my legacy was from helping other people. And then my books came after I had the technical know-how, not before. Right. So uh, several things come to mind when you're talking back to the uh, self-promotion. Again, this, the shameless self-promotion, what came to mind immediately is how it is that that's what children do. You know, yes. when the child makes the art or dresses up or sings something, or it's like, watch me, watch me shamelessly until they learn that that is not acceptable. It's what our um, dogs do, just their yeah. face expression. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about the interruptions. One oh, of our no, dogs. I love dogs. I'm a big dog. <laughs> yeah. I'm a cat person. Yeah. And a dog person. So. Yeah. Yeah, good. Oh, good that you, I'm glad you weren't distracted. You stayed right on course, even though we had this dog running around. Uh, <laughs> so it worked out. Um, so there's that. And I think that there is a place where uh, our, we've talked in fact about this in a coffee break podcast session that you and I did, I think where artists learn at some point where they're supposed to act like they don't like what they created, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like pretend that, Oh, I know it's awful, but you know, and it's sort yeah. of like all these are like conditioning things that we've learned. What I love about what you were saying a minute ago and, and it's not either or, and you started at it from the sort of technical business side of it. And yet clearly from the stories you shared, you have a love for art too. So what is that? How, you know, how did you learn those things and how is it that you have followed the art world? Yeah. So I, uh, I've always loved, I'm more of a fiction person. I've always loved literature. I was originally going to be a Spanish language um, major, you know, in college. And then I, basically failed <laughs> and they were like, you shouldn't do this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think that when you look at fiction, which is the thing I understand the most, I understand the most about books and how that works. You, you know, think books that become successful, there it often is a, a promotional aspect to the book as, as to why it becomes successful. That may have been forgotten, but if you know the history, then then you kind of know why things become, uh, you know, successful. So I, I do think, and, I th and here's what's interesting, right? Then it creates an illusion, right? One of the things I'm really interested in is illusion. That's one of the things I like about marketing. So, you know, take Stephen King, right? People fall into this trap of assuming 
that he's this great author and whatever he does becomes successful because his art in and of itself is so successful. But you can't look at Stephen King today, who's this you know, multi-billion dollar mega artist and, and realize that obviously the Stephen King of today can produce kind of whatever and it will immediately at least get the opportunity to become a bestseller and, can, and, and conflate that with the Stephen King when he was writing Carrie in his little trailer, right? So there's a path that has to happen uh, of, of promotion, right? Uh, another interesting, when you look at art, right? Look at Lady Gaga, it's very interesting. She's a fascinating artist. I really like her as an artist. And one of the things interesting, if you look at her trajectory, right? Her first works of art were very provocative and very sort of iconoclastic. And that shock value, right? This is the woman who wore a meat dress, I believe, to LAX, right? The shock value was part of her promotion. Now that she's much more successful, she's toned down the shock value and become kind of more artistic, um, as it were. And so her original launch was high shock value. And then over time, now that she's quite successful, she doesn't need that. So if you flip that around for most of us, we need something to break through uh, to get started. And that's, it doesn't have to be shock, but, but there is a breakthrough problem that you've got to deal with. Especially when you pick a genre that already has so many greats just alive and past. Like, so Stephen King, he is, um, he has so many popular books, but there's also a lot in his face that's competing for attention. And same with Lady Gaga. I mean, you turn on the radio and there's any dozen pop artists, just pick one. And they're all, you know, they're all doing well. They're all great. And so it's like, you have to have this initial, um, and it can feel conflicting. I know we've talked about it a lot. There's a lot of marketing tactics that feel, they just don't feel right. They don't feel good. And yet there is a space for putting aside your bias and testing something to see Correct. what happens before just automatically discounting it. And there's always a way to put your own authentic spin onto something that might seem a little, I don't want to say underhanded or shady, but something that you might not actually consider a tactic you would like as an artist because yeah. a lot of them love self-promotion or email marketing or SEO like all those you start mentioning those to an artist and like we said in the beginning your eyes glaze over and it's just like what no 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 let me just paint yeah many of them don't even like email marketing to their own list yeah for instance like when I say marketing audience I mean communicating mm -hmm. you know really it's about communicating yeah, now that's interesting that you mentioned that. So if you stick with authors, right, and this is where, you know, I, I often tell people we live in really the most exciting time for marketing, right? I remember marketing like before 1994, right? You were just stuck with like trade shows, yellow pages, print ads. It was really pathetic, right? Yeah. And now we have, you know, Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and email marketing. And, you know, we have all these opportunities, right? Well, you know, as an author, and I can speak as an author, we're in a fabulous new relationship with our readers, right? That our readers can talk to us and we can build relationships with our readers. And again, I'm a nonfiction author, uh, but I work really hard in my books to say, if you have a question, you know, email me, you know, just Google my name, Jason McDonald, and send me an email. And I answer every day, I answer two, three, four emails from people. And I cannot tell you how many people will respond and say, I couldn't believe you responded to me. Yeah. And then now we have a relationship where I can learn from them, like what are the problems they're having? And, and again, to be a little crass and commercial, I can say to them, oh, I just answered your question. Do me a favor, write me a review on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I have about 500 reviews of my SEO book, most yeah. of which come from, from favors where I do something for them. I answer a question, I help them out. And then I always say, hey, do me a favor, review the book on Amazon. So I have a good relationship with my readers, which it's sort of a pain because, you know, you know, you have to put yourself out there, but that's a new and exciting opportunity for authors, for authors. I'm reading, I just read, um, I, you know, I, I go through these spaces in my own fiction reading. So I just read that Flannery O'Connor's, both of her novels, uh, cause I love audible. I read a lot of books through audible and I just read them and I just had to laugh when I went on Amazon because she, of course she died in 
I want to say 62, but she died a long time ago. And it's like, follow the author to stay up, you know, keep up up to date with new, new, no, new novels. And I'm like, uh, Amazon, she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I love her as an author, but she's not coming back. <laughs> no new books. <laughs> no updates. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so before we had technical issues, uh, we were asking Jason about reviews. Uh, one, uh, and I interrupted Devani's question <laughs> to ask since Jason is an avid fiction reader, do you um, leave reviews for the books that you've read typically? I do, but I mean, I'm not the most representative person because I do marketing. So I kind of, you know, know the, the game of it. Um, so I, I do, but I would say what I noticed, right, is, uh, so I have read, uh, I mean, I read a lot and some of the, of the books I've read, which are nonfiction, I think a little bit more, I've actually reached out to the authors and written them, you know, emails and said, Hey, I read your book and I like this about it or whatever. And some of them responded back. And what I noticed, right, is very, very few of them will then take that next step of say, Oh, you read my book. Will you write me a review on Amazon? So, um, you know, the simplest thing about review marketing with, for, with respect to, and this goes for artists who are on Etsy, et cetera, is that asking. When you have that customer who's like, oh, I really liked what you did. I re it resonated with me. A simple just, hey, do me a favor. You know, here's how you go to Amazon and write me a review. It goes a long, long way mm -hmm. to working on, on, on that. Re it's so important to work on that review issue for sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, for you to have 500 on your uh, books, I mean, that makes all the difference. That's, that's why you're number one, mm -hmm. you know, in the search results. Yeah, it's huge for the Amazon search um, engine. It is definitely part of the search core is your reviews for sure. And I think this speaks a little bit with this kind of elephant in the room, right? The more creative types are often a little bit embarrassed about the commercialism of it. Yeah. Right. You know, and I think nonfiction art, uh, authors are a little bit less inhibited in that way. We're more like, oh, it's just, you know, it's nonfiction, yeah. and, you know, yeah. it's not an artist project, you know, whatever. But you have to get over that, like, barrier of asking for, and what you find, what I have found, right, is people who respond to your work and like it, they'll be honored to write a review. Yeah. They'll be like, a oh, sure, no yeah. problem. Oh, and then, and then they feel like, wow, I helped you out and you've got a relationship. Yeah. yeah. Well, something, there, so. something that I was wondering too on the marketing and you you're working with a fiction author. How many do you work regularly with fiction authors or is this more just like a one-time project you're taking on? Yeah. Or? So this is the I mean I have worked with authors and of course one of the things that's great about being here in the Bay Area is we're kind of number 2 publishing area after New York. I mean a distant number 2, but there are a lot of good opportunities in the Bay Area for publishing. Um, so I'm a member of some groups here in the Bay Area that are for authors and whatnot. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately, I mean, I do have a mortgage to pay and most of the people who have money are not authors. So 99% <laughs> of my clients are like, you know, shameless commercial making money entities. Um, you know, so yeah, but I have worked with authors. I actually had a guy who just took my Stanford class who's a historian, he's written a whole bunch of history books. And I worked with him on kind of his marketing strategy, like how he's gonna get the word out on his, his, his history books and kind of take it to the next level. He's pretty popular regionally, but he's trying to go higher up on right. that. So, how many, so in your experience, how many authors need to take on the role of sort of being the, their own brand? And how, many, uh, how much can they um, uh, take off their plate and hire out or hire a cheaper outsourcer to do for them or somebody like you to do for them. Like because there's some authors who are super extroverted and they love being their brand. They're all online and they do the best because they love that outreach and they love the community building. But there's also a lot of introverted authors. There's a lot of introvert creators who yeah. they just make and make and make and make. And they really could not be bothered, even though they know that the promotion and the marketing and the technical is so important. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> that the reality is that to succeed in today's, you know, digital environment, the author does need to take the bull by the horns. Mm. So, I'm not an introvert per se, so it's, it comes more naturally to me. Uh, but I hear what you're saying, and I know people will be listening who are like, oh, I'm really an introvert, and I don't want to do that. I, um, 
you know, a good book agent, a good promotional engine, a good person who can work with can definitely help you. I do still think that the author or the artist does need to be involved in the process. Maybe it's 80, 20, you know, 80% of the work is done by the outside consultant and 20% is done by the author, but there still needs to be some relationship, you know, short of just a, a miracle of, you know, you happen to be in the right place at the right time to get your book promoted. I, I don't think that's as realistic. And I, and I know that's really hard. And I, I, I know uh, I've given talks at author groups here in the Bay area and I'm, I always feel like I'm going to get pelted by tomatoes when mm -hmm. I, I talk about, you know, the shameless marketing of a book, but this is where I think people, if you know history, right. People are really misled. I mean, Van Gogh today, the artist Van Gogh is the artist Van Gogh because his brother's wife promoted him. He didn't do the promotion, but after he died, he got a lot of promotion from his brother's wife. And mm -hmm. that was instrument. Of course he had great art, obviously, but I am sure that somewhere in some very French countryside, there is an artist who's equally as good that we don't know about. Right. Who didn't have the, you know what I mean? It's catch 22, right? We only know about the artists who become successful. We don't know about <laughs> yeah. the artists who don't become successful. Right. Right. Well, it's so funny that you so. mentioned that. And it's so relevant, too, because uh, one of my favorite nonfictions is Jeff Goins, Real Artists Don't Starve book. And he talks a lot about the misconceptions of the starving artist. And he mentions Michelangelo. And we think of these greats as these poor artists who just did, you know, their art. And they were these floaty poor people, peasants, but they had this talent when that's not the case at all. They had lots of wealth and- Or not always the case. Or benefactors. Not always the case. Yeah. And they had, like Michelangelo had several streams of income from different industrious endeavors. So if you're an introvert artist, it might be a wake up call that a, it might take longer to get out of that shell and break the mindset of you need to be the promoter, but it also might mean that you do other things that make you money so that you can do the art thing without all the stress on top of it. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I mean, it's absolutely true. And I think anyone who's a creative uh, artist, you have to kind of grapple, but I suppose it's a little bit like being in therapy. You just have to confront that issue head on and yes. you have to find, you've got to make your peace with that part of it and, and how, how that works. And I, I know that that's a challenge. Um, it, it is, it is, yeah. what it is, but I think it's, I, I think it back to this illusion thing. We look at a great artist like Van Gogh and we, we see him as a great artist today. And we don't realize that behind the scenes, there was promotion that went on that created this institution of Van Gogh, the artist, even though he is the most stereotypical tragic artist sort of person who sold I think two paintings in his lifetime but that didn't stop his sister-in-law from from collecting and selling the paintings and, and really promoting it you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so I do think you know going full circle here back to the digital age you want to do you want to think about your promotion strategy I mean it's a sort of akin to saying well I want to bake a cake okay great now I've got the inspiration then you've got to know how do you break the eggs how do you do the flour how do you set the you know, how do you set the uh, stove and, you know, right. you don't frost the cake until it's cold, which my mom has taught me. Yeah. <laughs> kind yeah. of thing, right. You learn that the hard way you do it. Once right. Right. Oh, you know, that's really stupid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you need to know, I need me a little list here. I need a little marketing uh, Amazon being the 800 pound gorilla for books. If you're right. in, uh, you know, more of a, a, a artisan sort of issue, it might be Etsy or something like that or Pinterest, but there are different venues for different forms of art. Uh, and you've got to learn the game. You've got to learn how that works. Right. So now that we're stirring up the creatives in our community about the concept <laughs> of even looking at the word SEO, we also want to protect them from all the many spam emails we all get about SEO marketing services and getting you to page one. Because there are a lot of still black hat tactics going on in yeah. particular um, from non-North America countries who have a lot of old system like pre Google Panda and Penguin yeah. and all oh, that stuff. You, Panda and Penguin. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> the class there. Wow. <laughs> yeah, pre to that, prior to that, when there it was like the Wild West, right? It was the Wild West of the internet. Yeah. You know, before Google started saying, wait a minute, you know, these guys people are gaming the system and these people who are getting all the traffic are just marketers and what have you, and they're not the real content creators and and it's still 
there's still so much going on in the industry. Yeah. There are, but there are also many, uh, in particular Indian firms, because those were, that was the first place where the outsourcing migrated to. They were taught how to do this old form SEO. And now they have all these people who know how to do this old form SEO uh, who need jobs. And they have these large staffs. And so they're always sending these marketing emails out. Those aren't the kind that our audience needs. So what can they, how can they know a good SEO person from a bad or what advice do you have? Yeah, yeah you hit that really big nail on the head. I'm always a little bit ashamed that I do this as a living, right? <laughs> but this is actually one of the reasons I end up writing my books because I got kind of so sick of people who got so ripped off because my books came out of my class I teach at Stanford. And I would have people who literally would say, oh, I spent $30,000. I spent my last savings and I was just totally abused and taken down the river. Mm -hmm. So you're right, especially with SEO, not so much with social media or AdWords, but for SEO, there are a lot of scoundrels and thieves out there and you have to be very skeptical. You know, sort of rule number one, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Mm -hmm. So if somebody out of the blue says, I can manipulate Google and get you to the top tomorrow. I mean, do you really think that Google with its billions of dollars and genius engineers can be so easily manipulated that some little two-bit whoever can, you know, no, right? So yeah. don't fall into that trap of just that kind of stupidity, right? So be skeptical. One thing that the readers can do, which is really easy and very high value, is literally go to Google and type in the Google SEO Starter Guide. Mm -hmm. And we'll link that. surprise, Google produces a guide on how to do SEO. It doesn't teach you everything. It teaches you the basics. It's sort of Google's perspective, but it's very kind of what's called white hat or above board SEO tactics, such as know your keywords, put your keywords in your title tags, write good content that's good for humans, but also have some idea of what search engines want to know about. Mm -hmm. So one sort of easy thing to do is educate yourself a little bit you know, in the rules of the game and the Google SEO starter guide is a good way to do it. You can read my books, right? My books are not yeah. that expensive, you know, shameless plug for my own books, oh, Absolutely. you know, because you educate yourself. And then when you educate yourself, now you know a little bit about what needs to be done. You know, back to your earlier point, if you're the kind of creative author who, or, or, or physical artists, you know, you do photos or whatever, and you don't want to do this full time, but you, you at least are educated enough to know what should a, a, an SEO strategy look like, right? Yeah. So you're not taken down the river. You know what Panda is and Penguin and that you can't just do crazy things without getting penalized. So, so self-education is the first tool. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there are some good resources, my own books being one, the Google SEO starter guide being a free one to educate yourself. And then, you know, any good SEO company, so a SEO agent company should be able to say, here are my references. Here are some projects I've worked on. Here are some things I've done. I can't tell you how many times people will call me on the phone and they'll say, well, I'm looking for an SEO expert uh, in the Bay Area. And, you know, I don't know, how do I know you're any good? And I'll say, well, what did you do to get to find me? And they'll say, well, I Googled SEO expert Bay Area. And I said, well, who's, <laughs> who's number one? <laughs> you know, and said, well, you are. And I'll say, well, do you think that it's easy to be number one in the Citadel of digital marketing, you know, hello, right? No. And, oh, okay, that doesn't make sense. and then obviously I have clients. I don't release my client list publicly, but I can say to people, here are clients I've worked with. You can call them up and check me out. So, you know, back to business 101, you know, if yeah. you, if you were going to hire somebody to, to do a roofing job on your house, you wouldn't just hire the first person you met. You would do a little research. Yeah. Definitely. So, so common sense, right? Do some research, ask for references be a little bit involved and then there's a lot you, you, you can do without getting taken down the river by the scoundrels and thieves that yeah. populate this industry. Absolutely. That's so true because in this day and age, it's like, it's a really good thing kind of that you have to start off wearing all the hats of the various jobs you do because it is really good to have a, a basic education about basic what, what you're getting into. Yeah. 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 And know, and know your strengths and weaknesses. Like I don't do cover design. I'm not good at it. I hire people to do cover design. I experiment with my covers, uh, but I'm not an artist. I don't know. I'm not good at visual art. So I just kind of do the best I can, but I, you know, know your own weakness, but I also try to, you know, figure out what's, what's reasonable and what's feasible. So, so, you know, it's funny with the internet, people often, 
throw common sense out the window when it comes to the internet, which is really mm -hmm. strange, right? I mean, you would yeah. never hire a roofing company without doing, looking at their references. You just yeah. would not do that. Mm -hmm. And yet people will come to me and say, well, I spent $50,000 on this weird SEO company. I'm like, did you ask for references? No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, hello. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't want to be harsh here, but really? Yeah. That's it's like marketing works. So be careful because marketing works. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think that's self-education is, is, yeah. is, is step one. And a little cynicism is in order of two about unsolicited spam emails. Hello. Hello. Right. 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 Totally. right. Jason, we have kept you longer than we promised and we had uh, the technical difficulties. Do you have a few more minutes? Yeah. I have a few more minutes. No, no problem. I'm, okay. I'm good. I'm like, I'm about ready for lunch here in the Bay Area, but I can <laughs> Okay, good. All right. Well, just, because you do, there, there's so many things that we could ask you in particular. I mean, I, I'm just kind of curious when you said a recovering PhD, what do you mean? And because you're, and because now you're still teaching, you just said when we were yeah, off. Right. Yeah. So my, I have a PhD in political science, right? So I love learning and I was one of those people who loved graduate school and I lived in Europe and all that jazz. So I loved it. And then uh, you know, I got so much out of it that I use in my business today. I got so much out of it in terms of culture and whatnot. Uh, but I didn't want to be a professor, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I brought a lot of that in there. But I also today look at a lot of academics, right? As somebody who teaches marketing, right? You know, a lot of academic professors of marketing, they really suffer from this. They've never actually done it, right? They've just yeah. caught it, but never done it. And that's what I mean. I mean, I love academia. I love professors. I love learning. But there is a lot to be said for having done it and been in the thick of it. Yeah. As opposed to just teaching it. And I don't want to be too harsh to the academics of the world, but. No, yeah, because you're amongst them. You used to have to make friends. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, you know, everybody's got a role to play. But I think, um uh, there's a lot to be said for education and there's a lot to be said for practical knowledge and both are good. Okay. Right. Yep. Well, one of the things, so, so when we published your podcast, one of the things, the first things we'll do, just like the first thing we do before writing an article is to go to the tool that we use, which is keyword finder and just, and find the keyword that we might be able to rank for that fits, that makes sense to title the article. So not to put you on the spot because we can have this conversation <laughs> offline, uh, but as no, let me know on the spot. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm SEO an extrovert. Put me yeah. on the spot. Okay. Good. Good. So as you know, SEO marketing expert, author, et cetera, those are going to be very hard keywords to rank for. So what would you recommend? Uh, what thoughts do you have? And, and anything like, like, many in our audience are hearing the concept of writing to keywords for the first time. Sure. So maybe one of the ways we can share that with them is by you looking at what you would title this episode or whatever other um, example you have. Right. Well, excellent question. And, 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 you know, it, uh, ranking, right. Whether it's on Google, whether it's on Stitcher, whether it's on podcast systems, like, you know, iTunes, whatever, right. It's a game and you don't want to go after something you cannot win right? You want to go after something that's more winnable. So given your audience, given the people that listen, I would think some things that, that come to mind for me would be uh, book marketing, marketing for artists, marketing um, for uh, graphic artists or uh, physical artists, sculptures, things like that. Uh, because that's the kind of niche that I think people often look for. They, you know, they don't want to just know general marketing principles. They want to know, well, how do I market a book? How do I, how do I market as an author? How do I market as uh, on Etsy? How, you know, how do I how do I market if I'm producing crafts and and physical art? You know, uh, paintings and things like that. So I would do kind of marketing plus the genre or the the area. I think that's really interesting. You could also do SEO for that. SEO for authors. SEO for books. Um, people forget. You know, they're. You, people like Google, 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 right? Well, that's true, but there are niche search engines such as Amazon or such as Etsy that have similar rules. So there's SEO for Etsy, there's SEO for Amazon. Mm -hmm. And that's another area that, um, and we've alluded to that on Amazon, for instance, the review count on Amazon is very important to whether something ranks on Amazon. So that's an example yeah. where the Amazon search engine is different from the Google search engine. Right, yeah, for sure. 
So, so I think that would be some ideas that, that could help people who are niche, you know? Yeah. yeah, that's great. That makes a lot of sense. So what are the top one to three things that you notice that produce the best results for you in your business? Sure. So I would say uh, the, a couple things. I'd say the most important thing as a as speaking as an author, not so much as a consultant where I, I do lots of consulting for companies that already have products, uh, speaking as more of a creative person, uh, I, I would say the most important thing is kind of the zeitgeist, is when you produce content or you produce an artistic product that hits a cultural nerve that people are already kind of dealing with, have anxiety about, have interest in, that's when you really get a lot of traction, right? So my most successful book is my social media book, which I launched like 2010, 11. And I think because I hit the zeitgeist right at that moment, people started to get interested in that topic. That book just, boom, just sold right out the gate. And that was really the book for me that was like, wow, this could really be a good business opportunity. And looking back, I realized that it really hit the cultural nerve at that time. So any artist, I would think the first thing is look at the culture. And, and I don't mean the broad culture. It could be your specific you know, let's say you're a dog person, what are, what are people worried, you know, pit bulls, are they good or bad or ugly? You know, that's a, an angst in the dog community, right? Find that cultural resonance and, and work to that resonance. I think that's most important. The second thing I would say to people is in this new environment, you as an artist, you as a creative type, you can have relationships with your consumers with your fans mm. in new ways and don't be afraid of breaking down that barrier between you as a creative and the people who will consume or be interested in that process people love to look behind the scenes they love to know the creative uh, person so I don't I think this idea of the lonely artist is true but I think think about the collaboration you can do with people who like your art and I think that's another area that is really exciting about the new environment that we live in. So that's something I would, and I, I, I love my readers. I love them. Yeah. And a lot of them love me back. Not all of them, but <laughs> you know, so, so I think that's a really exciting and, and, you know, you, you just get so much out of them. So do you communicate with your, do you have an email list, a su substantial email list of your readers and how do you acquire that since you can't get those through Amazon? So how are you going about yeah. it? Yeah. So again, nonfiction. So I produce free books. I have uh, books on free tools that I produce that people can sign up for. If you go to my website, if you just Google Jason McDonald, you'll find my website. Uh, I have free books and the free books are through email. So that's one way I build a lot of pre-readers. And then all of my books have registration. So you can register and you get some additional goodies when you register your book. So and, and in fiction can do this too, right? There can be yeah. bonus chapters. Maybe there's yeah. alternative endings. There's things yeah. that you can do as a fiction writer to incentivize people uh, to join your email list. Oh, and then smart. once they join your email list, now you've got a relationship and you, hey, I've got a new book coming out. You know, do you yeah. want to be a pre-reader? Yeah. You know? it's, yeah. It's a lot. So you really want to, you're right. You want to work on your email list and think about why people join email lists. They usually want to get something. So think of additional information in them. Right. And they want to connect. They want to connect. One of the mm -hmm. things we, we know that seems to be a theme that's resurfacing throughout here. And we've had that conversation. They want to connect. Yes. yes. I have my, I'm writing a new book just on marketing because I learned from my readers that a lot of things I took for granted marketing concepts, they didn't understand. And they didn't like, what's a business value proposition? They didn't understand that. So yeah. I thought, well, this would be a good book to write a basic intro to marketing that's for practical. So I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm working on this book now. Um, and I'm using a program called Beta Books. So if you Google Beta Books, betabooks.co, they allow you as the author to put your book up and then people register and then they comment. So I'm the first book I've ever written where I'm putting these embarrassing drafts up. Mm -hmm. And then people are reading them and I'm looking at their comments. And then now, I, and I have about 400 people on my reader list for my new book. So I'm, I'm learning from them what they like, what they don't like, what are questions they have. I'm getting so much out of them. I love my beta readers. Wonderful. And then when the book is ready, I've got 400 people. I can say, here's the book. 
it's ready, thank you, you send them an autographed copy, you know, review it on Amazon. So I should be able right out the get-go to get a couple hundred reviews on Amazon of the book. So that's, that's and, and that's available for fiction authors too. Uh, that's okay, on the same that's service? Amazing. Yeah, beta, we definitely. Betabooks.co, and it's a, a service that you allows you to kind of have a private place where you can create your content and then people can interact with it. So if you've got your super fans, I have like 21,000 people on my mailing list. I emailed them and said, Hey, I'm writing this new book. Do you want to be on the beta list? And that's where I got my 400 super fans who, and I'm like, Hey, give it to me straight, bad, ugly, you know, tell tell me like it is, you know, and, uh, and, and I'm getting a lot out of that. So that's an example of, of collaboration as a new form of writing, you know, you know, I'm still in charge. It's not going to be a book written by committee. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that wouldn't be good. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's speaking of your book, you were mentioning before we got on the podcast, what you were struggling with. And we always ask our guests, like, what is a struggle that you have currently? So do you want to get into some of your struggles with creating that? And Yeah. So as an author, speaking as an author, what are my struggles? So one of my struggles is, tearing out a time in my day to just write and ignoring the world. And that is the hardest thing to do. So I try to write every day from six in the morning to seven 30 and not read the news and not read my email. And it is so difficult to just set aside that time. That is in, 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 in and I'm not an author who's just, this comes easy to me. It is difficult. That's, that's one. I think the other thing I really struggle with is, you know, you have a draft and it's it, the first draft is just so horrible and it's just such an awful, horrible, disgusting, ugly, yuck. <laughs> you have to work through that. You have to have this hope and this vision that when you're done, it will be good. Right. And so I'm using beta books and I'm putting up not the first draft, but like the third or fourth. And it's like, okay, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> you, okay. you, have to, you have to have a good ego that you're like, even though you tell people this is a draft, right? This mm-hmm. is a draft. I think that really you struggle. Every author, I think, struggles with that because yeah. it is so imperfect. So that's, so that's hard to overcome. That is now a couple of questions. Because one of the things we mentioned to you before we started recording as well that we like to do is if we can contribute to you after all that you contribute uh, contributed to this podcast and to our audience from your wisdom and knowledge. Um, but that would be so. A couple of questions about your your creative struggles. You said you try to create between six and seven thirty. So how long? How many times? Like how? Consistent have you been with actually doing that? Has it been happening? Like, you know, if you've gotten a role going? Yeah, so I'm probably doing it about three times a week right now. And I also try to do all my consulting work during the week. And on the weekends, I do my writing. And I'm, I would say I would give myself a grade of a C or C minus. Okay. Right? I and would say it's a real struggle to just grind that out. I find you have to grind it out and ignore the world, which is definitely so difficult to ignore the world, which will still be there when you get back. Right. Right. And I'm not, and I'm struggling with that a great deal. So what is the biggest struggle with ignoring the world for that hour and a half? Is it that people are calling you that if somebody's knocking at the door that you have the notifications popping up? I think two things. I think it's the anxiety of like, uh, my regular clients are bothering me and I'm not doing a good job for them because I'm ignoring their problems, which are always there. You know, and I'm sort of like, well, if they don't like me, they can quit. That's <laughs> the first one, right. It's just to ignore the things that need to be done for them. And I love my clients, but ignore them. The anxiety of like, Oh, I'm not doing a good job for them. I would think that's one. And then I think the other one is that the first, especially the first draft of, of anything is painful and and difficult and so i'm always ready to click over to the new york times and read a time you know an article or click right. over to twitter right uh-uh. because that's easy that's somebody right. else's production that's ready to go you know yeah. like get sucked in the whole donald trump thing right which is this 24 7 circus right <laughs> ignore it and and that, but but it's just you have to stay in, it's like exercising you have to yeah. stay in the thick of the pain yeah. And, and it's, you know. 
But when you do, so here's the thing, if you can do that for even just like say six or seven days consecutive, um, you know, so the three days helps but if you can do a little bit each day and you know, the thing about the, um, the clients and, and all of that, and no one should have access, access to you 24 hours a day and yeah. you always be able to carve out and separate and segregate. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, these things, you know, you teach these things. We're sharing this with you on this podcast to also help our audience. Um, but I cannot tell you, I mean, I know the same thing. I have the same struggle. Like I, and we I work with uh, outsources as well. So in right. the mornings, like because they're in the Philippines in the mornings is like there, there's like that perfect slice of time yeah. where we're both awake and able to work together without one party being way too tired, which is where it interrupts <laughs> with my primary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think it's important to, to segregate your time and say, yeah. Like I try to look at Fridays. I do a lot of writing on Fridays. Usually I can kind of catch up and I can say, Hey, you know, it's Friday. Nothing's going to happen until Monday. I'm going to ignore it. And on the weekends, I do not respond to clients on the weekends. I do not take client phones on the weekends. I yeah. write my books on the weekends. Those are two good days. I get usually two, three hours a day and writing and, but it's the guilt of, and it's a 24 hour constant, you know, people, it's amazes me how, if you send an email to some, sometimes you can send an email at, 11 o'clock at night and people respond like that. It's like, you <laughs> yeah. turn your phone off. Yeah. You know? So yeah. that's, that I think is my, those are my, my struggles. And I'm, well, I'm hearing that, is them. there, uh, you said that on the weekends you get a, a couple hours in because you don't have the client distraction. Is there a way throughout the week that it doesn't have to be a whole hour and a half in your morning? It, you can just chunk it back down so that at least throughout the week you have that continual momentum going, but it just doesn't have to be this huge amount of time. Like yeah, I, I think that's true. But like to your point about the Philippines, I have a fair number of East Coast clients. So mm -hmm. often they want to meet with me early in my morning. And sometimes oh, that's the yeah. only time they can. So mm -hmm. it kind of fries your schedule. So I think that's a, a struggle I have, right? You know, you set aside this time and then inevitably there's client crisis and it really is a crisis. And you're like, oh, I've got to deal with this. And then it throws you off. You know, yeah. so you, you get kind of knocked off your rhythm. I don't know if you guys have experienced that. But oh, yeah. I work that. Psychologically, you're just, you're, you know, like, I'm going to do this. And it's like, it's kind of like going to the gym. You're like, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to stick with yeah. it. And then you get knocked off. And then once you're knocked off, you're like, okay, well, it's over. Exactly. That, that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. That workout's no good. Yeah. yeah. So, so you just have to take control. You know, for you and any creators listening, if you don't look at the phone, you don't look at the email first thing, you're not going to know about the crisis anyway. And, yeah. so, and so guess what? It'll still be there when you come back online at 731, you know, 735. It'll be there. It'll still be there, absolutely. So you just have to, you know, basically what you're letting that be is your excuse, you know, for not getting, for doing the, for not doing the hard thing in the moment. Um, and I think that, but, but what I wanted to ask about that is you said you like to write. Um, and, and so, so is there, like, is the struggle just that it's the beginning stages of a book and that's the hard part or what is it that? Yeah, so I would not say I like to write. I okay. like to have the production. I have it, like to have it done. I like to have it. I, I like the discovery. I mean, it's sort of like I, I look and I'm a very much an analogy thinker. It's like going to the gym. I like the feeling after I've worked out. Right. I like being in shape more than I am. I like that. But I don't like the treadmill. I right. don't enjoy it. You know, right. I don't do that, you know, and whatever. But um, so, so I think that negative and, and I think some of that is sort of mindfulness is just being aware that when you're writing, you know, any creative person, if you were making pottery, I would assume it's the same problem, right? You're baking a cake if you're that kind of an artist. A lot of times it's just not fun. And I think you have to accept that some parts of the process are just not enjoyable. You just have to slog through them to get to the, the higher satisfaction. And I, I do think that's, that's a, a challenge. And I think the self-doubt, I think any person who's creative has a lot of self-doubt. So I think you produce something and you just think, oh, God, yeah. you know, Will this work? You know, will you know, people like it? Yeah, I was just, I got off the phone this morning talking to um, a potential client and they were talking about how, and I have the same issue as you. Like if, if I can't respond within 20 minutes of a client sending me something, I'm just like, oh my God, they think. Feel guilty. Uh, yes, I feel so guilty. And I think that the biggest thing I've let go is generally if I take longer to respond, by the time I do respond, it's not so urgent on their list anymore. Like to them, it's an in the moment urgency. and. Yeah. You finish, and if you end up responding an hour later, they're like, "Oh, I totally forgot about that." Yeah, that's true. You know, yeah. 
you know like, like, origin than it is that's that's definitely true yeah. yeah and so it's like we have to remember that everything is urgent in the moment and an hour later it's probably in this day and on. age they've moved on exactly too. they're yeah. like wait what problem yeah. are you even yeah. talking about <laughs> yeah that's yeah but, uh, um i remember i was talking to someone this morning and she was like uh I love my book, but also it might suck. It might totally suck. So just, you know, and there's well, that. Well, I think book. the other thing, like a, my daughter, my a younger daughter teases me. I wrote a book on Donald Trump right at, after the election. I kind of wrote a very quick, weird book, kind of trying to process that whole thing. And it completely flopped, completely flopped, wasted money, wasted time, everything. And she teases me, hey, dad, how's that Trump book doing? You know, and, and I'm always like, you know, you have books that do really well. Right. And you have some that completely flop. I have a book on passwords completely flopped. Right. But, you, know, but you can't not everything you're going to do is going to be this great success. So you have to also be willing to invest the time and money and blood, sweat and tears. And but then when you're working on a new project, like I'm working on this new book just on marketing, you have this anxiety like, oh, Lord, you know, is this I'm doing all this work and is it going to fail? And, and you have to that's hard to detach from, you know, like, yeah. you know, yeah. Maybe it's going to fail and then no one's going to buy it, but maybe I will get something out of it anyway. I will have figured this out. And back to your writing it. So the other thing I was going to ask is, do you, you do well with video. You have, you put out a lot of video trainings, um, which a lot of free resources on your site and online on YouTube um, to help people learn how to do their own SEO. So, and you're good with conversation. You seem to be in your, you said you're extroverted. Yeah, so. but now I feel very guilty because like I have not produced a YouTube video in forever. And that's, it's like, oh Lord. No worry. Yeah. Well, no, it's still out there. Though. I yeah. mean, that's the thing. The beautiful yeah. thing is no matter when you produce it, it's still out there. And in many cases, valid. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, the, I mean, have you, if you've ever tried talking your book, as, you know, in the beginning stages? Uh, yes, I have. So I have tried that. I've not been successful that, you mean like the first draft, I have tried that and I have not particularly found it to be, to work for me. I found it better to just type out the rough draft. I, sometimes when I read it, when I edit it, I find if I read it out loud, the editing comes more easily. I yeah. have more mistakes and problems and flow but the first draft, I have to type it out. I've tried it, but no. It doesn't work. That's not worked for me, no. Some people that works great for, I know that, that I'm like, eh, yeah, try okay. that. Okay, good. I have to just yeah, yeah, I'm, slug, I'm, slug yeah. through, I mean, make a little outline and slug through it step by step by step. So it's, when did your, so what is the exact title of your new book and when does it come out? Yeah, so the book is called The Marketing Book. And uh, the kind of catch to it is it's called The Think do measure method of marketing. So I'm trying to explain to people, you have to think, you have to figure out a concept like SEO, like what is it, right? That's the thinking process. You've got to learn what it is. And then you got to go do it. You got to actually do it. There's no point in just learning about it. You got to go do it on your own website, on your own Etsy store, whatever. And then you have to measure it. Did it actually work? What can I learn? So I've kind of taken all these concepts of marketing and, and, and set them into this think, do, measure uh, system. Okay. But awesome. it is, and I'm hoping to have it out by the end of August. Okay, good. Well, we'll ping us when it comes out and we'll be sure to republish your episode and add, oh, the, link, yeah. add the link to the, to the um, podcast show note page and all of that. Um, before we come ask you your final question, um, or the final question we have for you, um, um, what are what would you say is for someone who's new to all the SEO and who doesn't even know even understand the concept of keywords, which is simply search terms that we use in Google? Yeah. Um, what would you say is the, the one most important thing, the one or two most important things they could do early on to to move their work forward in the SEO world? Yeah. So I would say the most important thing is, is the, the keyword challenge. It's, it's look at the world from the perspective of your customer. So if you are selling, you know, um, uh, vintage Rolex watches or you're selling, you know, uh, art, art made from, um, you know, uh, Swarovski crystals or whatever, right? I'm not an artist. I know what those things are from the past from clients, right. you know, right. but if you are looking for that, look at the world from the perspective of your customer. What do they Google? What do they type into Google, right? Yeah. And then, no brainer here, take that phrase and put it on your web content. 
if you want to rank for, you know, uh, homemade dog toys, put homemade dog toys on your content. That's yeah. the most important thing that people, I can't tell you how many people I've, I've come to me as clients and they're like, well, we don't rank for, you know, dentist San Jose. And then you say, well, look at your website. It doesn't say San Jose anymore on your website. Mm-hmm. Wow. So why would you think yeah. you would? Do you think I Google's a mind reader, right? No, yeah. no, you know? So you've got to get, know your keyword and put it on the page. Now there's a lot more to that. Yeah, but right. That was a <laughs> simple thing. Yeah, that's yeah, a start. Exactly. That's, that's, a simple start. Thing. that's a starting point. Good. And I appreciate you circling back to that because I know you mentioned some good ideas on that in the beginning. Did you want to finish it? Yes. So the cl- last question that we're going to ask you, what are your dreams? What are my dreams? Uh, so I'm actually working on a novel. So I want to transition to be a fiction ah, novel. So I'm, yes, I'm, I wondered. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm transitioning. So I'm struggling uh, with uh, some ideas for a first novel, and I'm struggling with that. Hopefully, taking what I learned about nonfiction writing and then learning how to write fiction and doing a good job at that. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, maybe we can interview you again when you have a fit, when you have the fiction. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do you have already ideas? Like, so how far are you in that process? Or do you already have like, uh, I have about two or three that I've kind of half written some introductory parts to and they failed. And then now I've got a new idea about how to do it that I haven't got. Actually, interesting enough, I'm, I think what I'm going to use is I'm going to storyboard the novel and then write it from storyboard. So I think I'm, learning a lot from YouTube to use for fiction writing. That's my current thing. Awesome. But I'm a pathetic, just to baby fiction author, but I'm an avid fiction reader. Well, there you go. So you should be a good one because you, I mean, you love it. First of all, you love the genre and there's no way you can't, but have wonderful ideas about creative things. If you're an avid fiction reader. As and, well. and I think everybody is good at some things. And I mean, I, I look at fiction authors and I'm just like, Oh wow. I mean, they're just, there's parts of fiction where, like uh, I read Great Expectations because my daughter was reading high school and I'd never read it. And I thought, oh my Lord, I felt like such a bad parent. I was like, I love it. It's so wonderful. How can you not love this novel? You know, yeah. and she's 14, she's like, this is stupid, dad. And I'm like, oh, you don't have no idea. You know? I mean, I just cried some of the sections of the, the art and the, the artistry. So yeah, I love fiction. I love fiction. And sometimes you never like an assigned book at sc- in school. <laughs> There's just something about it. When it's assigned, you yeah. just youth, talk about youth is wasted on the young. Youth is wasted <laughs> on the yeah, young. Yeah, right, definitely. Well, Jason, this has been wonderful. I will definitely link to your website, Jason McDonald. Uh, dot com and jasonmcdonald.org dot org thank you for that correction we'll definitely put that correct link in there and yeah thank you so much for sharing your experience awesome it was wonderful to talk to you guys okay look forward to rehearing myself and you on the podcast awesome Awesome. excellent okay okay all right bye-bye bye Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.